Back in July, I led a Boy Scout backpacking trip along the PCT in the Marl Mountains. The troop hiked 56 miles in six days. It was a lot of fun, but I had more time off and I wanted to challenge myself with a bigger solo hike. So just a week after getting off the trail for six days, I was going back out on the High Sierra Trail. Uh, it's also just simply called the HST, and I'll probably go by that from now on. I learned about the HST from a coworker. He recommended a documentary that's shown at the interpreted centers in both Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. It's available on YouTube, and I'll put a link in the description. I found it fascinating mostly because it was the first long distance purely recreational trail, and I had never heard of it. Some of the things I learned from the documentary was that the work began on it in 1927 when the park management wanted to connect the original park with the rest of the park that was just tripled in size. Uh, they wanted to connect uh, Sequoia National Park all the way up to uh, Mount Whitney. The trail is five, four feet wide. It has never has more than 8% grade. Uh, and it was uh, started during the prosperity, you know, the roaring 20s, but then ended during the Great Depression. They used no safety equipment, but they also had no fatalities. Uh, it was finished in 1932. A traditional High Sierra hike starts at the trailhead in Sequoia National Park, heads up to Mount Whitney, uh, the tallest peak in the contiguous United States, and continues down to Whitney Portal over uh, the High Sierras. So you go all the way to the other side of the High Sierras. The route is 71 miles long. I've already hiked to the top of Mount Whitney and 2015 with my nephew in the middle of a July blizzard. Uh, there is, uh, and, and so I didn't really want to do that. There is another popular route where you start the same place, but you go over Forester Pass and end in Kings Canyon National Park. Going over Forester is cool because it's the highest point on the Pacific Crest Trail. It's over 13,000 feet high. Neither of these routes were really possible because of permits. So those, so those popular spots were already snatched up. I decided to start my hike in the Jenny Lakes Wilderness, which is sandwiched between Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Park, um, and uh, come in onto the HST from over Colby Pass and then work my way back to the uh, trailhead. It's an 85 mile route that would take about five days or a hundred mile hike that would take about six days. I got to the trailhead, which was called uh, Rowell Meadow, uh, just before midnight. I slept in the car, breakfast had orange juice and donuts before hitting the trail at 8.05. The plan was to go 13.5 miles and stop at Roaring River. There's a sturdy bridge there that goes over the impressive river. There's also a ranger station and a stable for stock animals. People will explore this area with horses and mules. It was early still and I knew uh, Colby Pass would be tough the next day, so I decided to continue. I skipped over a perfectly good campsite at a cement table meadow because I thought I could do better. When I got to the next meadow that was aptly named Big Wet Meadow, I realized my mistake. I kept going into dark and got hit by a thunderstorm. I was climbing out of Big Wet Meadow when the rain stopped, so I pitched my tent on a relatively flat spot next to the trail. Besides a small group near the trailhead and a man hustling down from Colby Pass near sunset, I saw no one else that day. It was a tough day. In the end, I did nearly 18 miles with over 3,000 feet elevation gain. Day two started with coffee and packing up wet gear. I was able to hit the trail before seven. Looking back towards sunrise made Big Wet Meadow more appealing. The first challenge was getting up to Colby Lake, but once I was there, an early lunch, did some fishing, but got no bites. The slog over Colby Pass was disheartening. I'm glad I did the extra five miles the day before. Doing nearly 20 miles and going over a 12,000 foot pass in one day was not realistic. The view from the top was awesome. Uh, I was worn out, but once I was finally going downhill, I could start to really hustle. Stopping by the Kern Kawea River uh, for a bit, I saw a marmot, but I couldn't get a picture. I thought I was doing pretty good until towards the end of the day, I had to climb out of the river valley to jut over to where I was camping at Junction Meadow. These tight switchbacks were tough. But there was more downhill after that, and I rolled into camp about seven. It was nice to put up my tent in the light. Day two was just as tough as day one, with over 15 and a half miles and over 3,000 foot elevation gain. But it was finally on the HST.
Day three was probably my favorite day. I didn't see a single person all day on day two, but now that I was on the HST, I was finally running into people. I decided to day hike to the PCT, trying to get to Forester Pass just to see it. Camping up on the PCT seemed like a lot of work. At this point, I was leaning towards the five-day plan. The first two days had kicked my butt. I was ready to relax. It was four miles and 2,000 feet elevation gain to the PCT, but without my pack, it was easy. I got back to the Junction Meadow uh, to pack up camp. I had lunch, then just ate gently sloping downward miles to the spring, to the current hot springs. On the way, I saw a bit of the river that just screamed at a fish in it, and I was right. When I got to the hot spring, I dumped my pack and had a soak. Had the place mostly to myself. Some people checked it out from a distance, but did not get in. Back at camp, I had trout for dinner. I had done 16 miles in just over eight hours and was feeling great. Day four. You can't beat the restroom view at the Kern Hot Springs. Here I'm showing off my Garmin inReach. Speaking of which, on this day my plans went off the rails a bit. Julie and I were in communication via the inReach. I was counting on her to pick me up at the HST trailhead and ferry me back to the Rowell Meadow to pick up the car. Before I left, she had hinted she and the boys might want more time at her folks' place. During the course of day four, it seemed clear she'd prefer a six-day plan, and it might be better if I could stretch it to seven. I told her I could evaluate my food situation at dinner time. This day had the biggest elevation gain, nearly 4,000 feet. At lunch, I managed to drop my bear can full of food in the spring, but everything survived. I was warned by a group of passing hikers that there was a rattler 10 minutes ahead. That was the longest hour of the whole trip. Moraine Lake was nice, but I don't think there's any fish in there. On the way down from Moraine Lake, I got the first views for which Sequoia National Park is famous for. Since I was no longer in a hurry, I didn't try to make it to Hamilton Lake. Instead, I stopped way short at Old Big Aurora Ranger Cabin. There was a small stream there, and I caught a couple of small trout. After dinner, I laid out my food. Thanks to the fish I caught, I could have enough food for seven days. Although the big mileage I had done at the beginning was for naught. Despite the elevation gain, I managed to finish in less than 10 hours, so I had leisure time at camp. Besides fishing, I had a fire that I shared with a couple of other hikers. With three days left, I only needed to go 23 miles. I was going to have to kick up my lounging a notch. Day five, I started hiking at 725. I had a thousand feet of elevation gain up to Kawea Gap. It was the last part of the trail to be completed in October of 1932. After that, it, it would be all downhill to Hamilton Lake. Views start getting amazing at this point. I pass by Eagle Scout Peak, renowned for the Eagle Scouts that climb it. Oh, I finally get some pictures of marmots. Shortly after the gap is Precipice Lake. There are tent sites here, but it's awfully exposed at 10,000 feet. I bet it is windy and cold up here at night, even during the warmest months. Right before this picture was taken, three eager boys with squared away packs, followed by a man with a certain look about him, past me going the other way. I told the man I bet those are Boy Scouts. He confirmed my suspicions and told me he was their scoutmaster. This picture is of the rest of the adults struggling to keep up. This troop was supposed to go to Philmont, just like ours, um, and was hiking the HST as a replacement. Just as you get to the first views of Hamilton Lake, you come to Hamilton Gorge. This gorge was the biggest obstacle for completing the trail. In 1932, the Hamilton Gorge Suspension Bridge was finished. It was 125 feet long, 200 feet up. It weighed 40,000 pounds. It was hauled out on mules. No girder was longer than six feet, so they fit on the mule, 
Wire ropes were walked out like giant centipedes, each man carrying the wire were about three to five feet apart. The bridge only lasted five years. An avalanche took it out. Now it lies in a twisted lump at the bottom. The bridge was replaced by a trail and tunnels that dig right into the side of the mountain. Since I only had to go eight miles, I got to Hamilton Lake at noon. So I took a nap under this tree. I fished, but the fish were too small to keep. I swam, and I watched the nature channel through my tent flap. Day six. This campsite occupied by 20-something men played cards until late. They put chair-shaped rocks around a rock-shaped card table. I started hiking the earliest yet, 647. The area I'm entering here is called Valhalla. This is considered the most beautiful part of the park. I've hiked Yosemite and the Grand Canyon a lot and thought nothing could beat them. I now think Sequoia wins. Underneath this bridge lies the remnants of his predecessor. Found some thimbleberries, just like the ones we ate on the PCT. This is the High Sierra Camp, located near Bear Paw Meadow. Fortunately, heavy snows damaged them in 2019. They had no reason to fix them up for 2020, so they're still in disrepair. Hopefully, it will be able to resume operations in 2021. It has operated since 1934, providing lodging to hikers. Late breakfast at a river bridge, followed by a close encounter with a deer. More trail dug into rock face. I thought this rock structure was cool. I think it looks like a lady kissing a fisherman while her mother looks on disapprovingly. I set up my camp site at Merton Creek at 1 p.m. after backpacking 8.9 miles of mostly flat and gently sloping downward trail. I had lunch and hung out in, the, in and around the creek until the weather set in. came for them and now it's theirs for us. I'm assuming that's what happens with Warner Bros. Once all these other, I don't think they're going to keep streaming or licensing those titles out for stream. When it cleared up, I had uh, a late dinner. This snake, disturbed by the heat, wiggled out of my fire pit. Day seven. I ate breakfast, but amazingly, I still had a little food left over. I got going about 7.12. I walked leisurely since I didn't expect my wife until noon. And I only had five and a half miles to walk. 
Julie delivered me to the start and took this last picture to show what a week on the trail looks like.